All right, so my name is Marcus. I'm with IBM Research, and today my colleague Bruno Vavala from Interlabs will join us through this computer and present as well. And today we uh, will talk about Fabric Private Chain Code. So, someone in the room who has heard about that project before, raise your hands. Oh, wow, okay. Have you also used it? Oh, yeah, okay, cool. All right, let's, let, let's start easy, okay? So, why do we want something like Fabric Private Chain Code? So, there are many use cases where the blockchain actually makes sense. In order to trace data on the blockchain, everyone can see the data and verify that certain things are going on correctly. However, some use cases come with um, very privacy sensitive requirements. And there are, I mean, um, a bunch of examples like, like sealed auctions, voting, healthcare supply chain. And all these use cases, they have some portion of privacy requirement in it. So for a sealed auction, we understand that if we submit a bid, it should be, should be private um, until we um, evaluate the auction and release the winner. For voting mechanism, we should actually never reveal the individual bids. For healthcare data, well, I don't want my, uh, my patient's data stored on the blockchain, not good. And for supply chain use cases, so we can think that, I mean, people are making contracts, uh, making good deals for uh, buying certain gifts, storing that on the blockchain might be nice for traceability, but sometimes we don't want to reveal the good price we got uh, to our competitors. <coughs> Luckily, Hyperledger Fabric already comes with a few of built-in mechanisms to, to solve uh, those use cases or to solve those issues. For instance, we have channels where we can basically yeah, establish multiple blockchains on our network in order to split the participants and only the participants can see the data what they should see on the transactions. Then we have private data collections where we only exchange the data among the people who need to know the data and submit essentially an, a hash or commitment of that data on the blockchain. <coughs> and then we have private uh, or transient fields which allows us to put data in a transaction which do not show up in the end of the day on the ledger. However, all these mechanisms are making a good contribution towards pri privacy sensitive use cases. Um, we still have a problem. And the problem is that all the data is still visible to the endorsing peers. What do I mean with that? So I mean endorsing peer which executes our functionality or smart contract needs certain data, most probably the sensitive data, in order to process this chain code. So for, let's think about that, in a, in a voting uh, example, where the government then runs an endorsing peer, well, maybe that's not a good idea that the government then, when they execute the smart contract, can basically encrypt or do, uh, or basically um, see our data in clear and process it. That's not nice. <coughs> In order to understand that a little bit better, I have a single slide which represents Hyperledger Fabric where we can see we have the clients, we have the peers in the middle and the ordering service. And the peers, as I already said, they are responsible to execute the chain code, maintain the word state and the ledger. So if you're saying, okay, for, for my use case, I'm actually fine um, that a certain organization can process the data that's fine for me. However, think about deployment use cases where your fabric peer is deployed somewhere in the cloud where you don't have control over your data. So you, d you do not know if the admin maybe is malicious. What should you do then? <coughs> so in order, uh, in order to overcome this, uh, those issues, um, we have introduced Fabric Private Chain Code, which is a framework to, to build, deploy, and run private chain codes on top of Hyperledger Fabric, which is exactly built in order to tackle those use cases where privacy uh, is an issue. And we, we solve or we tackle that problem by leveraging trusted execution technology or confidential computing code nowadays, um, like Intel SGX. Who of you have heard about Intel SGX? Very good, all right. 
And so by leveraging this technology for our smart contract, we get, we get essentially three nice properties. So the first one is confidential compute, where all the transactions and the ledger only contain encrypted data. And only the smart contract or chain code running inside the trusted execution environment um, will get access to our data in clear. That means that the endorsing peer does not uh, see the data in clear, only encrypted data. The second property is um, verifiable operations. So with fabric private chain code and the use of trusted execution, all the transactions, they are actually um, verified through a mechanism called attestation that allows us as a, as a user to verify that our smart contract is protected in such a trusted execution environment. And this we can basically then uh, transitively um, show for each transaction and say, okay, this transaction has been executed by a trusted execution environment. Here's the attestation that it's r using Intel SGX, things like that. <coughs> and this also brings us to the, to the last property, which is uh, data misuse prevention, because we now um, bind our data through encryption to our uh, actual chain code. Um, we, can base, we, we can get a measure in order to control who's allowed to access our data. <coughs> and now I will give uh, the word to Bruno. Let's see. Hi, everyone. FPC enhances confidentiality for fabric chain codes by using hardware-based security mechanisms to isolate the chain code from the rest of the platform. Our current implementation uses Intel SGX to create an enclave, which is a protected environment where the sensitive chain code runs. The hardware enforces the isolation of the enclave, which means that outside components, such as other hardware, the hypervisor, the operating system, and any other application, cannot tamper with it, nor read any sensitive data. This allows to preserve integrity and confidentiality at the fabric peers. Finally, a hardware-based attestation allows to distinguish an FPC chain code from a regular fabric chain code. This allows to establish trust in an FPC chain code running remotely before communicating any sensitive data to it. Here is an overview of FPC and how it integrates with Fabric without modifying Fabric itself. So you can use FPC in your existing deployments. As in Fabric, so in FPC, orgs have to install and approve the chain code that they want to execute. In FPC, additionally, the chain code definition includes the MR enclave, roughly corresponding to the hash of the chain code attested to by the hardware for integrity purposes. At initialization time, the chain code enclave generates and attests some cryptographic keys, which are crucial for the authenticated encryption of client communications and data storage on the ledger. The orgs can then look up an enclave's keys using the enclave registry. And this is a regular fabric chain code which collects, verifies, and shares such information on the ledger. At this point, the FPC chain code is ready to execute transactions by receiving encrypted invocations from clients and delivering encrypted responses to clients. All of the lookup, cryptographic, and storage operations are handled transparently by the FPC client SDK at the client side and by the FPC shim at the chain code side. Both components expose interfaces similar to the Fabric client SDK and to the Fabric shim. Now, back to Marcus. Thank you, Bruno. Isn't that real? <laughs> yes, please. So say that again. So right now, Fabric Private Chain Code does not um, um, integrate uh, private data collections, but we we would like to work on that. Yes. Well, that depends. 
I guess, on the configuration of the private data collections. Okay. But, but if uh, a chain code needs that data in order to make a decision to run your logic, then that endorsing peer, uh, assuming it has the rights to basically consume the data from the private data collection, basically needs that data. Yes. Um, but my understanding is that you can transfer the data to the private data collection without with only writing the hash of the chain. Yeah, that's correct. Um, I mean, the, so the, the, the contrast with using confidential computing is here that we're basically isolating the execution of the chain code from the endorsing peer. So the, the endorsing peer does not see the content. So when the when the admin of that machine does a memory dump, he will not see the data in clear text. No, I understand. I'm, I'm not going to put secure data on the chain. It's only going to be in the private data collection. That's why I'm trying to see if I really have a problem. But the endorsement system, the organization participating in the private data collection sees the raw data because they need to execute business logic on that. So uh, my understanding, at least, please correct me if I'm wrong, but is that with uh, 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 this approach, not even the uh, endorsement suite of the organization themselves have access to the raw information. Yes, exactly. So this is a, this is a difference. No, I understand the general principle. I'm trying to see if I don't have the problem. <laughs> well, if, you, if, if in your private data collection, you don't tr even trust the organization extracting information from uh, 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 the data communicated with the business logic executed with yeah. smart contracts. Hey. So can I suggest that we do that discussion maybe after the talk? I mean, super interesting. Let's definitely have that discussion. <coughs> Any other question quickly related to your understanding of FPC? We did a very fast one-on-one -on -one here. Okay, so let's see. I mean, how, how, can, how can we use this stuff now? Um, I mean, um, you, the easiest thing you can do, I mean, get out your laptop and type this command in the console and then you get everything you need to getting started with Fabric Private Chain Code. So in our repository, we have an SDK to build uh, Fabric Private Chain Codes in two languages right now, C++ and Go, which we'll I talk more about in a, in a second. We also have uh, an FPC client SDK, which is very similar as Bruno already mentioned uh, to the traditional um, Fabric Client SDK for Go but it basically helps you to, with all the, let's say, uh, nasty parts of the security, in particular the encryption or data protection when you're communicating to your chain code. We also integrated uh, recently uh, the Fabric Smart Client. So you, from your Fabric Smart Client application, you can also call Fabric Private Chain Codes. And you find, will find many more examples how to um, take your FPC chain code, deploy it on a Fabric test network, for instance. We also provide a Dockerized development environment, which comes with all the um, tools you need uh, in order to get started without uh, installing uh, um, a lot of stuff on your machine. <coughs> Let's quickly talk about, I mean, how to write FPC chain code. So as I said, there is C++ chain code. The reason why we introduced C++ chain code is when Intel released their Intel SGX uh, technology, they only provided an SDK which allowed you to program your code in C++. So we had to go that direction at, uh, when we started that. Um, as a usual chain code, you basically start uh, writing your invoke method and then you can do all the things like, I mean, getting the parameters um, from the transaction inputs you can get the state and put state operations. Um, the nice thing from, from the user perspective is that our FPC shim basically um, provides you all the features to protect your data. So this is very similar to a traditional chain code where you just write your data in clear. However, our FPC shim takes care of encrypting and decrypting those data before it's going on the ledger. But moreover, we, um, the, the shim provides mechanisms in order to uh, produce a signature on our transaction, saying, hey, this transaction was really executed inside the trusted execution environment. 
um, using the remote attestation capability of Intel SGX. So now you may think, hey Marcus, are you serious? Do you really want me to implement my chain code now in C++? Nah. And this is why we have uh, FPC plus uh, Ego, which is a, a Go compiler to compile your Go application to run it inside Intel SGX, which leads us, um, or which gives us now the possibility to take your Go chain code and run it inside, uh, run it with FPC. <coughs> so this is maybe now more familiar to you. So we can now write um, a normal Go chain code, also uh, use the functions which uh, are provided by the shim um, or by the stub. We can uh, run put state, get state, things like that. And very similar to the C++ version, um, all the complexity is hidden behind um, our um, framework implementation. <coughs> and the what I really um, um, find pretty cool in, in that project that this was a collaboration with the University of Bern with the crypto group and there a student Ricardo um, Zappoli uh, spent quite a lot of time to to hack this together and build uh, our and help to build our uh, our preview. In order to integrate now FPC, there are actually very minimal changes you need to do on your application. So you just import the FPC. FPC um, 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 library um, and wrap your chain code as a new private chain code and compile it with the tools we are providing in, <coughs> in our repository. So now the scary part. I will try to do a live demo in order to, to show you that this is really real. So and the idea is, hey, let's pick one of um, the uh, samples which we have on in the Fabric samples repository. And I would suggest that we go with um, Asset Transfer Basic um, sample. There we go to the Go chain code. If we go there to chain code again, you will see here the smart contract implementation uh, of a chain code. And let's look at this for instance. So here we have a a method or a function which is implemented to create an asset. Uh, the asset has an ID, a color, a size, an owner, and, and a value. And that looks pretty straightforward. Um, so we, the chain code checks if the asset exists. It will create an asset, marshal it to JSON, and then performs a put state. So as a traditional chain code, you understand now th that in the right set of that transaction, um, the, this object as a serialized um, JSON string will appear in clear. Our goal with FPC is that this is not in clear anymore. So how, we, how do we do that? So I created um, a little yeah, sample which is available uh, in our FPC repository under samples, demos, hyperledger, global form. And here I basically only have uh, a single main function which we need to modify now. Let's see if this works. So what we need to do is, so with Fabric Private Chain Code, we use the chain code as a service model to, to, to run our chain code. So what we're going to do is, we go here to the main file of the asset transfer, take this asset chain code, I think we can ignore this error for a moment. Then we also need to import the logic. So now in order to make it an FPC chain code, we need to wrap it. So luckily Goland will help me figure out the right Go imports here. That's good. So next thing is we need to build this. Uh, we will use um, our, our tools building on top of the Ego compiler. Um, since um, that might uh, involve multiple 
um, command in the command line tool, I provide here a little make file with, with, a, with a reference uh, make file which you can use for, um, for your application. The only thing what we need to configure is here to give the shank code a name. FPC basic asset transfer. So, and that should be, should be it. Let's see if we can build it. Let's cross fingers. Um, FPC path samples demo. We are here, right? There's our make file. Let's cross fingers. Doesn't work. Hmm. Okay. So the thing is that it complains that there is no ego compiler on my machine installed, which is also reasonable. It's a Mac. It does not support into SGX. But as I promised before, we have a development environment for Docker. Um, so I'm switching now into a Docker container, which also runs on, on this machine, having all this stuff installed. Um, samples, demo. Right, here's all our stuff. So let's hit make. So now you can see it uses the ego compiler to build our, um, um, our chain code. And then it also packages for us a Docker um, image containing the binary uh, plus the runtime uh, things you need in order to run an SGX application, essentially. <coughs> so if we look here, what, what we got now, we got now uh, a binary, we got uh, a proper public and private key pair, which is used to sign actually the binary so that uh, we can make sure that um, me as a developer, the, the, the correct um, um, chain code is actually executed. And more interestingly, we also got this little um, file here, which contains um, the MR enclave of our chain code. And the MR enclave is basically, as Bruno said, a hash of our of our chain code logic, which clearly identifies our logic. We we will uh, need that later. <coughs> so let's. So now we have uh, a Docker image. Let's see Docker images. Yes. So and this is apparently the Docker image we just built. Cool. So. Next step would be, let's run our chain code. Um, however, when running the chain code, now we're actually entering the, let's say, the, the, the madness uh, of deploying or running uh, chain code or running um, Hyperledger Fabric. In order to make this easier as a developer, um, we, uh, we would like to use um, the Fabric Smart Client uh, integration test suite which allows us to uh, spawn up easily uh, a fabric network, install our FPC chain code or any other chain code uh, with a uh, few lines and just run and test it. So you don't need to deploy your actual, um, an actual network. <coughs> so for that we have in our samples and deployment fabric smart client. There we have um, yeah, a project. And this project here has a topology.go. And in the topology, we can specify now our network. What you can see here is that we specify a fabric network with two organizations, we enable FPC, and we install an FPC chain code with a given um, chain code name and uh, a chain code image. <coughs> Because I don't want to actually, I, I would like to reuse this project now. Um, I don't, I don't uh, change here the code, but um, in the other terminal we saw that we basically have these export statements, which we can load uh, for that example. <coughs> so uh, in order to do that, we source this little file. Mm -hmm. And then we can just make a run, which hopefully does something now. Yes. So it's starting now network. Now you can see, hey, orders are uh, 
spawning. Fabric piers are spawning. <coughs> we can also see that we install chain codes here. I, maybe you cannot see that. I mean, I saw that uh, quite often, uh, which is very nice for debugging, but maybe for a presentation, not really ideal. Sorry for that. <coughs> but so what we will also start is um, an Hyperledger Explorer instance in order to see then uh, what's, which chain code is running on, um, on our network. So it's still installing. It takes a little bit. Any questions so far? Yes, so the MR enclave is part of the attestation you get from an enclave. And the attestation essentially will say, hey, I'm an enclave, I'm running this particular code, which is corresponds to the MR enclave. And then this entire attestation thing, in case of Intel, um, the EPID, attest uh, EPID based attestation is signed by Intel. So, and then you basically get that, you can verify that this statement is signed by Intel. You can check that this attestation contains the MR enclave you are happy with. Which so you have to configure it somewhere in the network? Yes, so um, as Bruno said in his part, we put the MR enclave as part of the chain code definition. So in the normal fabric life cycle, um, we need to install the chain code, we need to create a chain code definition, let this approve. And by adding the MR enclave, all the participants on that channel or using that chain code, they agree on a certain MR enclave. And under the assumption we have a reproducible build, a reproducible build that actually works pretty well. <coughs> All right, so now our network is up and running. Let's quickly see if Explorer is there. It's loading. All right, so we can see there are two nodes, two chain codes. When I go to the chain code panel here, I can see now that our FPC basic asset transfer chain code is, is installed and another one, which is our enclave registry chain code. And the enclave registry chain code is basically uh, um, our, our entry point in, in the system in order to store the attestations in order to um, track or maintain a list of what are the enclaves installed on our channel and uh, what are their um, public keys? What are their encryption keys I need to use in order to send uh, a message in a way that the endorsing peer does not learn the contents of it? <coughs> yes. Not at the moment. Um, so right now, when, when we install or when, when, when we register our enclave, we essentially also uh, store the IP address of the endorsing peer, which runs that particular enclave. So therefore, the ERCC is right now used for us as a discovery. Um, okay, so we see now the FPC chain code is installed. <coughs> and... So in order to, I mean, produce a transaction now, we will need to use the Fabric Private Chain Code SDK in order to uh, let the uh, invocations be encrypted, protected, things like that. In order to demonstrate that, I would like to use also in our samples under applications a simple uh, CLI, which is essentially, I mean, a little CLI tool which allows me to invoke transactions under Inside, it uses the um, Fabric Private Chain Code Client SDK to encrypt the data. So let's quickly build this. I think I also need to source again um, in order to in order to configure now the the client very similar to all the configurations you do normally for the the, the peer command. You need to provide I mean the endpoint um, of the peer you would like to connect to things like that. Um, Let's do that quickly. <coughs> uh, 
And our test network also provides us now uh, a little script to get all these um, Writing and uh, talking is sometimes incompatible. Um, deployment. So we would like to now configure our client as org one. So this is the stuff we need to specify. And now we can use um, this client to invoke a chain code. The function we would like to invoke, let's quickly double check again what was the actual command here in the code. So we need to provide an ID, color, size, owner. Okay, so ID, let's make this thing blue, we make it size 10. Who wants to own it here? Hard? Sure. <laughs> Perfect. And yeah, let's give it a good value. Yeah. All right. So now you can see that something is not working. Aha, uh -huh, so I forgot something. I forgot the function name. And I think this was create asset. Create asset. Let's try again. Cool, worked. So here in the terminal, you can, since I've uh, enabled debugging, that you can actually see that something is going on. Um, you can see quite a lot that um, uh, the enclaves are uh, now doing something, I mean, running the chain code, endorsing the transactions, things like that. If we now look at the Explorer, we should see in our latest transaction, which is this one. Can you read this? How does this work? <laughs> let's see. So let's quickly open the the right set. And I try to make it as big as I can. Let's see if this works. No, that's worse. <laughs> okay, so what we can see in the right set is that we see the key 101. This is the ID we specified in our command. And at the value, we don't see so much. I mean, we see something. Um, however, if we would run this as a traditional chain code, we would see here the, um, the JSON string of um, our asset as produced here. So maybe for you an exercise f at home is install uh, the normal, tr the, uh, this chain code as a traditional chain code, run this, open in, uh, in Explorer, and then you will see that uh, the traditional one will appear um, in clear text, but with FPC not. Okay, so this is the data uh, we, we, we see now on the ledger. Let's see if we can get the, uh, back the data in clear. So now we do a query, I think it's called read asset. Yay, we got it back. All right, so this concludes my hands-on uh, demo on FPC. <coughs> and it worked, yay. All right, so, and I mean, if, if, you, if you think that's a nice thing and you would like to see mo uh, more of it, there is another demo today uh, by Koshi. Um, he's also here in the room. Uh, he will also show FPC in action with a different, with a real use case, let's say, not with my uh, little toy application here. Um, and uh, yeah, please go enjoy his talk. Um, and also, um, Check out our um, GitHub repository, uh, join our community meetings, talk to me here at the Hyperledger Global Forum and uh, get in touch with, with us and use it if you, if you find it useful. Thank you. <laughs> question.
So you can uh, only query by key and get back the decrypted data. Is this correct? Well, so. The so uh, the rich, as you said, rich queries actually require you to, I mean, have some meaningful information inside of your keys in order to make uh, a good query. Um, so this is the reason by, uh, that we right now by default do not encrypt the keys, only the values, in order to allow rich queries. However, we, we all have we have all the code in place that you, as a user, if you also would like to um, encrypt your the keys as well, you can do that. But then you're sacrificing uh, the usage of uh, range queries. That's true. And the second question, the requirement is like, in the past there have been known uh, security vulnerabilities with uh, on CPU side with SGX events. I think recently the, there were some new publications on that in the conference in August. So it's like that. But anyhow, especially considering the fact that it's a proprietary technology. Uh, have you considered or have you made any considerations also how such vulnerabilities would impact the security guarantees that you're trying to provide? Yeah, so, I mean, as a, as a researcher, I would say, yeah. So if your trust model says, okay, trust the trusted execution environment, then you're fine and don't care about side channels. But this is, reality looks different, right? Uh, so what you were saying, th this is a real thing. Um, I personally believe that Intel does a very good job in uh, going to academia and um, I mean to the open source community, throwing the hardware and letting people, I mean, really fire on it in order to basically uh, reveal such limitations of the technology. But on the other hand, they also provide fixes and improve that. So that's a good thing. And um, I mean, as any other technology we built in the security space, uh, it's most probably never perfect. It always has have something, but we, we definitely would need to integrate uh, additional measurements in order to deal with it. So for instance, uh, in Fabric Private Chain Code, you could say, okay, my, my enclave code is only, or in attestation, my enclave is only valid, I don't know, for a week. After that, you do a key rotation, things like that. Um, but those are really additional means you have to put on top on that. So, yeah, you should not always rely on, on one thing, a security me measurement, right? Yeah, it was, it was yeah. No, no, that's, no. So the other thing w what we would like to look is to extend also FPC to different trusted execution technologies other than into SGX. Um, which is not a trivial task. I mean, the um, Linux Foundation, they created this confidential computing consortium in order to bring all the manufacturers on the same table and see, okay, how compatible uh, are our te different technologies here? And if we could also use this for Fabric Pavichenko, that would be ideal. So we could imagine that we build then a policy that a certain chain code runs in SGX and on AMD SEV or whatever, and if both agree, come to the same um, result when they execute, then this is considered to be even more trusted than just executed by Intel SGX. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? So, um, do, 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 do. I think um, right now we require at least Fabric 2.3. Right now, our client SDK does not work with the gateway um, um, work we just have uh, seen here. Um, because there, think about that, uh, with the gateway, we as a client, we send our um, request to the gateway. The gateway then does, uh, does all the magic with it and then needs to end up in the enclave. Um, However, that would be something we could actually um, solve um, by just engineering work so that still the client does uh, the pr protection of the data sent to the gateway, things like that. Uh, then as a dependency, yeah, we have the ego compiler, uh, which we need, or for the C++ chain code, the Intel SGX SDK um, that you need to use. But other than that, Well, okay, so I mean, as a requirement, you definitely need a machine which is capable um, 
ha which has Intel SGX available. Um, in Koshi's talk, you will uh, learn about um, how FPC can run on the Azure cloud, for instance. Um, yeah, otherwise you basically, you just need the hardware. But for, f but for just playing with it, um, I mean, there I, I tried to demonstrate this on my Mac using all, all uh, our uh, Docker-based development environment. So you mean? Uh, this is right now not implemented. That's true. So right now we have basic functionality for chain code, um, but f for every other feature we we need to think about. Okay, if one chain code calls another one, that chain code might need to also verify that the other encl enclave is an enclave running the expected code, things like that. So this is not yet implemented. All right, I think then that's it and uh, we go for lunch. <laughs>